Hi, I'm Lauren Pear, host of Screen Time Reset. And uh, welcome to our second episode today. Um, on the first episode, I explained the premise of the show, which I'm going to recap briefly, because I forgot to mention an important point that's relevant to today's show. So basically, the idea is that, especially in the last 10 years, we've fallen into this relationship with screens and tech, where we're consuming maybe more than we ever thought or intended. We're starting to notice some of the consequences in our own life, and research is also coming out. So with all this new information, it's time for us to reassess our relationship with tech and create a conscious relationship where we really try to harness the benefits and minimize the harms. I also mentioned that I'm going to be focusing on families and children to start with for two reasons. First, that children are more susceptible to tech because they don't have the prefrontal cortex development to exercise self-control to say no. And second, because they're more sensitive to the effects of tech. Now, that's what I didn't uh, explained last time that I want to briefly touch on today. They're more sensitive to the effects of technology because they're still developing their bodies, their minds, and their nervous systems. And as we develop, we're very sensitive to stimuli, external stimuli and environmental stimuli. And tech is incredibly stimulative, so it has a very profound impact on them. So those are the two reasons that this show will start by focusing on kids and families. And now I want to transition into the uh, topic for today's episode, which is the Waldorf education system and how it sets kids up for success in the digital age. And how this became interesting to me is when I started researching this topic, um, I got interested into it and I got my research cap on and was digging for information and was finding a number of these harms and ways that tech can interrupt healthy child development. But there was a complete mismatch with what the media was talking about. There was still so much excitement about educational apps, individualized learning, which is fine, not that there are no merits to that, but it didn't feel very balanced. So this disconnect made me question myself and wonder if I had somehow created this self-referential negative research bubble. And what really gave me confidence that I wasn't making it up and that I was onto something was reading an article about technology executives and how there was a trend among them that they were shielding their own kids from excessive technology. So I got very interested in that because these are the parents in the know. They understand the tech industry better than the rest of us, where it's going, how it's affecting the economy, the skills you need to succeed in, the tech, in this tech world that we're all living in. And so it was really fascinating to me that a bunch of them were sending their, their children to Waldorf because it takes a tech light approach and clearly they were sending their kids there because they felt like it was giving them advantages for the digital age. So that's what I want to explore in this episode is, is how Waldorf in particular and a tech light approach more generally can actually confer benefits to kids in the digital age through first allowing them to take better advantages of the unique opportunities and tools that we have now and I believe honing humans uh, children's human competitive advantages, which are the things humans do better than computers. It's a key part of that. And the second piece is that it also, um, you need to prepare kids to avoid the growing number of traps that line our digital landscape. So today to talk more about Waldorf and what it provides for children and how that's relevant in this digital age, I am very pleased and happy to welcome my two guests today, who are both teachers at the Honolulu Waldorf School, Yuka Otaka Bryce, who teaches second graders, and Alicia um, Maley Sadok, who teaches sixth graders at the Waldorf Middle School. Yes. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having us. Absolutely. So my first question is if you would just please explain to me and the audience what Waldorf's philosophy surrounding technology and education is. So with Waldorf education and our tech approach, it really goes hand in hand with each other. They sort of complement each other. With the Waldorf philosophy, I mean, it's, it's been a global independent school movement that's been happening for like 100 years now. So it's sort of really deeply rooted. Um, but what I love about it is it sort of creates this merge of academics and arts, experiential, hands-on learning, um, and kind of creates a very strong foundation um, for the children of building creativity, building critical thinking skills through this, this foundation of imagination and creating lifelong learners. And um, what's really exciting is with our education system, it's such an active educational process. 
where the children are really deeply engaged with all of them themselves. Um, and technology tends to be a passive experience where they're just sort of receiving information or receiving images. And so it contradicts what we're trying to do with the children. Um, and so in order to have I, that. Yeah. Sorry, especially at younger ages, yes, right? I know yes. previously we talked a little bit about yeah. development. Right, 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 and the developmentally appropriate yes. tact yes. that you take yes. at Waldorf. Mm -hmm. Could you yes. tell us a little bit about right. that? Right, so the curriculum is all catered towards the individual needs of the children and where they are at developmental stages. So it's really important that we bring technology at those developmental stages appropriately well. And so they need sort of a strong moral, um, social understanding and sense of responsibility before they can engage in this the cyber world to become a digital citizen in, in the right way. Could so, I add something to that, Yuka? Absolutely. You know, one of the things that we're looking at when we talk about the appropriate, you know, the appropriate time to bring something is, for instance, in second grade, when you look at a second grader's development, you're looking at somebody that is starting to toil with these ideas of morality. So Yuka's bringing fables, the silliness, these stories of the saints, you know, something that really grounds people and gives the kids something to enact with, something that really means something to them, instead of like you're referencing with technology, you know, you can put a child on an iPad and all of a sudden they're having information put on them. So no matter what the developmental age, what we're trying to work with is the actual life of the child. When do they need to build social morality? How can we work with that instead of breaking everything up and making it very industrialized? Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 We'll that get does. Further in. Yeah. 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 So when do you guys see as the appropriate time to incorporate more technology? And when you do bring technology into the classroom, how do you do that? And what do you see as the biggest benefits that technology brings to children? Um, well, there's a couple different approaches. So there are some Waldorf schools that will have children in eighth grade start to use technology. But before they do, they'll actually have them take apart a computer and completely rebuild it. You know, we do see in the seventh and eighth grade children beginning to type certain papers. We try to work with them in that way, but more so it's in the high school. So when you're looking at the high school, you don't want to just immerse the children immediately into here's a screen, figure it out. Although the way the world is today, they do figure it out in a heartbeat, <laughs> no matter how old they are. A lot younger are. often. <laughs> right, yeah. How many three-year-olds do you see with a phone watching something? Um, so it's really a tool in the high school and it is a tool of progress, right? It is a tool to serve them in their education as opposed to a tool to teach them. And um, you talked about them constructing the computer. What's the mm -hmm. idea behind that? Why do you do that before they use it a lot? Um, so not every school does that, but it's certainly something that I find very compelling. The idea is that the study of the eighth grade is a lot about the Industrial Revolution. So really looking outward into the world and the becoming a global citizen. So the idea in response to the Industrial Revolution is to have these deconstructed metallic plastic pieces and figure out how to put them together. So it's the ultimate jigsaw puzzle. And once a child goes through that process and they can turn it on and see how it works, well, that completely shifts your thinking of a computer. You've put it together. You are the master over the machine. The machine is not the master over you. Mm, I think that's so important. Yeah. It's a really powerful lesson. I like that. Yeah. Um, my last guests were veteran teachers um, from the Virginia public school system, and they had mentioned noticing this, that it's a lot harder to get students to come up with their own opinions or arguments. And they said that actually a lot of longtime teachers are noticing the same thing. Absolutely. And I found that really shocking um, because it's so fundamental, I mean, to come up with your own opinions. And I, I think the other reason that it's a little shocking to me is, is this uh, issue of autonomy. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're not coming up with your opinions, mm -hmm. then you're someone else's puppet, kind of, right? Exactly. You have someone else's opinions, which is a bit scary. And uh, a year or two ago, I had the opportunity to go to a Waldorf open house on Maui, and it was there that I learned that, that Rudolf Steiner actually started Waldorf in part in response to World War I. He mm -hmm. thought that propaganda was a huge problem and that the mm -hmm. Europeans were sort of uh, goaded by propaganda into this super destructive, yeah. um, unfortunate, and unnecessary war. So he wanted mm -hmm. to create an education system of independent critical thinkers that would be more resistant mm -hmm. 
to propaganda, which I mm -hmm. thought, first of all, was really cool. What a great yeah. reason to start a, a, a type of school. And second of all, it's so relevant today mm -hmm. in this age of fake news, hyper-partisan right. reporting <laughs> on both sides. Right. Yeah. Um, so could you talk a little bit about how Waldorf, starting at a young age, creates and promotes and cultivates the foundations for children to be independent, critical thinkers? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, yeah. start. Yeah. <laughs> I love this. Um, I mean, you can just come onto our campus and walk into a Waldorf kindergarten, and you see displayed out on the shelf these sort of simple nature-based open-ended toys. So a simple red silk becomes an extravagant cape or a flutter, the butterfly wings. And you allow the children to create their own inner story. But as screens, you're participating in someone else's story. You're and consuming so you're, someone else's you're story. You're consuming someone else's story. Exactly. And so you're, we had to continue giving these children opportunities to create their own stories. And in that way, we have a play-based sort of education system in the younger grades where they have to self-initiate their play. And so Which is hard you hear work. So, children, so many children say, I'm bored, I'm bored, give me something to do, because yeah. they're so used to being entertained and constantly given what they're supposed to be um, thinking um, mm -hmm. from the outside and so this self-initiated play is so important in those younger grades and it gives them that sense of independence it gives them that control and power um, in their situations and another thing is if you walk around the Walder schools you hear the teachers telling oral stories um, so this strong rich oral tradition of passing down knowledge from one generation to generation is still really relevant for us um, because you tell a child a story, um, they have to take that, process it in their auditory senses, and create their own inner pictures. And that's work. You have to work at creating those inner pictures, and with those inner pictures is this capacity that is very important that you'll touch upon later. But um, I think another aspect that I, I really feel that it creates this quiet confidence in children is that the children are asked to create their own text. So mm -hmm. instead of these pre-digested material that's presented beautifully in this textbook um, where they have to memorize these isolated facts, we're asking the children to create something within themselves, um, to think for themselves, to integrate what knowledge they have received and output it into something for us to see and display. And I think when you give a child a blank canvas and a blank paper every single day to tell us to show us their learning, I mean, they come they come out into the world, any problem is solvable, anything is doable. Mm -hmm. They have this initiative and this innovation. I love yeah. that point about them creating their own pictures is work. Because yeah. if you see kids listening to a story, that doesn't look like work, yeah, right. but it is for them. It's yeah. so okay, much right. more work to have to create your own picture in your mind than to just see mm -hmm. a picture and consume it. And to me, that really, that imagination which can often be I think undervalued I used to I think undervalue education people that mm -hmm. are more rational logical thinker it seems yeah. like more of a frill perk but it strikes me now that that's coming up with your own opinion yeah. mm -hmm. it, there's a similarity yeah. that you have to come up with these things Absolutely. inside of yourself mm -hmm. and maybe we used to take it for granted but in this day and age with what teachers are reporting we can't Right. anymore and it's really critical yeah um, and I, I think we need to take a break okay. but we will be right back okay. hi I'm Rusty Komori host of beyond the lines on think tech Hawaii my show is based on my book also titled beyond the lines and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence leadership and finding greatness I interview guests who are successful in business sports and life which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness Join me every Monday as we go beyond the lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. Hi, I'm Lisa Kimura. I'm the host of Family Affairs on Think Tech Hawaii. Join us every Tuesday at 11 a.m. to talk about the issues that really matter. Everything from policies that need to be changed in Hawaii to the fact that we need better gender equality so that we can all have a better shot. Again, join us every Tuesday at 11 on Think Tech Hawaii for Family Affairs. Aloha. Hi, and we are back. Um, did, did you have something that you wanted to add to that last uh, point we were talking <laughs> yes, about, about information? You, 
or um, imagination? Yeah, yeah. I think one of the really important things to think of is imagination is just not only in the realm of the early childhood, the younger grades. It actually is a transformative property. So as we look at this idea of inner picturing, of inner sensing, of holding an image or a story, what ends up happening as a child gets older, so I'm in the middle school, is now children are able to take a concept like physics, take these experiments that are being demonstrated, and they're able to imagine and connect them in a conceptual way to what's in the world. So this is really the transformation of imagination, right? Right. So when we go out into the adult world, having that facet, that strength of your life, knowing that you have that ability to create an inner picture, means that you're an inherent problem solver. You're somebody that can connect the dots, and all of that starts with really embracing imagination. And that's, once again, I don't think it's necessarily intuitive to a lot of people that right. those little connections between different conceptual pieces, mm -hmm. that's actually like a leap of imagination yeah, absolutely. in a sense. And so it's so um, foundational. Absolutely. And that reminds me, uh, Yuka, you had talked about how you encourage um, at Waldorf uh, in the elementary school kids not to consume media during the week. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so this, the storytelling that we provide is actually a vessel of their learning. So they might learn the story of the golden goose and the letter G emerges, that letter sound comes out through that experience in, in the first grade. And what happens with those stories is we let them kind of settle into their sleep life and really penetrate deeper um, into themselves. And it cannot happen if it's competing with sort of these fast-paced, really dense mm -hmm. um, images that they see um, on the screens. It completely gets wiped away. And yeah. so to honor sort of their learning and to honor this space of childhood, we really want to let those Acti maybe media related activities settle for some on the weekend would be a nice way. To yeah, that. that idea of competition yeah. I think is really powerful and something yeah. that I've learned about our memories is the more emotionally charged an experience is, they're sort of higher up in the pecking order of our memory when we're going yeah. to sleep. And media is so good at, at hitting our emotions. Right. I mean, there are yeah. people paid a lot of money with high budgets. Right. Yeah. And so little kids for the first time creating pictures in their mind, yeah, that's yeah. not going to be able to compete. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I, I, I really resonated with that. Yeah. And um, that, that also made me think of something that uh, Alicia had said about um, the freedom that a Waldorf parent felt because their child was now in an environment where the norm was not to watch media mm -hmm. all the time during the week. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about the, the freedom that, that parents feel and the value of a community that's kind of on board? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because you think about, you know, we observe other schools that are walking around where our children are, you know, in the same neighborhood. And it's so fascinating to see this difference in the children and the way that they engage with the world. So particularly one thing I noticed with my class is they would much rather be at the beach hanging out together. They would much rather be on a hike, doing something together, engaging socially, and that's more preferable to them than to sit around and text each other. And how often do you see kids nowadays that sit in a room, in the same room, and just text each other? Right. You know, so their preference is really to have an agreement that they want to hang out in person. Um, last year, my class actually made their own technology agreements, which was really interesting to see fifth graders agree that there was a need for it. Yeah. Because they recognized that they were at this valuable age of childhood, and they wanted to play. They wanted to be with each other. And I think the media, by making that agreement, it really takes a lot of that away from them. And they recognize that in a deep level, how much they need each other as people. Yeah. And, and because it's so, I feel like a lot of parents are tackling this issue alone. But mm -hmm. it really is a community issue. And so oh, even absolutely. if there was a school that was a little more tech liberal, yeah. just the value of the fact that your class discusses what they think right. is appropriate and that the parents and the school are kind of working together, I think there's so much value in that across mm -hmm. the spectrum mm -hmm. of um, you know tech light to right. to more tech liberal and to make a shared agreement you know it's really it can be really iffy when we talk about technology because there's such a big split right in yeah. the way we raise children and it's so easy to make somebody feel like they're a villain for you know texting somebody or 
for letting their kids watch a movie or for right. not having their kids on a screen, that they're behind. You know, there's so much of the back and forth. So I think no matter what realm you're coming from, the most important thing is that you do create a community agreement. Yeah, and conversation. Yeah. Right, a shared value. And uh, your point about how your kids would rather hang out in person makes me wonder, I mean, one of the most, I think, obvious and well-accepted negative consequences of tech is that kids are not as good at interpersonal skills. They can't oh, make eye contact sure. in the same way. They can't start small conversation. I was working yeah. for State Senator Russell Ruderman last year, and certainly our business leaders were complaining about that. They'd mm -hmm. hire someone they can't even make small talk with a customer, right? right. Yeah. So do you think that Waldorf students retain more um, interpersonal skills, and how do, you, how do you see that? Oh, absolutely. Um, we do a lot of service work out in the community, and one of the things I see is the kids, when they're walking, they look at every person that they walk by. They look them in the eye. They say, aloha, hello, thank you. They help people cross streets. You know, they do all of these things that we idealize and hope for our children that they would be that polite. And a lot of that does come from the fact that they're used to looking each other in the eye. Mm -hmm. um, we had an open house not too long ago, and I had some of my sixth graders host, you know, walk brand new parents around the school. And it was so astounding, sixth grade boys, for a family to come, a complete stranger, and they would look them in the eyes and tell them about our school, what we were doing, and walk them around. And I actually had one parent ask me, who was from outside of our community afterward, did you pay them to say those things? How do you get them to look you in the eyes? Mm -hmm. And it was stunning, because yeah. it's so atypical to have a child that really wants to engage. And as far as looking long term, as an employer, I would think you would want somebody that can look you in the eyes, that can engage with anybody that walks into the room. Absolutely, they're yeah. asking for it. And those, you know, that independent critical thinking and those interpersonal yeah. skills, those are the some of the core, what I call these human competitive advantages. Absolutely. Things we do better than computers, and so things students are gonna have to have to be relevant mm -hmm. in the digital age when you're competing with AI mm -hmm. and automation. Absolutely. And just to add to the interpersonal, I think, what it also builds is this capacity for collaboration and to be able to work with other human individuals and to work through problems mm -hmm. together. And, you know, I Definitely. think we need more collaboration to tackle on some of the issues that we have in our world right now. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Um, one point I want to uh, touch on quickly, I wish I had more time, I'll get to this more at future episodes, is is uh, the mental health question, and then I'll ask you guys to, to okay. wrap up with some suggestions. Yeah. And um, you know, just the, the role that social media plays, mm -hmm. and cyberbullying, and mm -hmm. also these negative messages. Um, do you think that there are, do you think that there are, are, are benefits, or what, what do you think about the mental health question and, and how tech light can yeah. aid I think it's, it's, you know, it's multifaceted because I think of small children that are given technology and I think about that long-term range. You know, when you give your child a device, what you're doing is you're training them to have a sense of entitlement, right? They don't have to imagine, think through, play. What they have is something that you push a button and it does something for you. Mm -hmm. You know, so long-term, what are we looking at in terms of mental health in children? One, you have children that have this kind of inbred sense of entitlement, but even further forward, we're now looking at how dopamine receptors are flooded by technology. Right. So if you're doing that with your children and allowing that opportunity to occur and reoccur, well, they become addicted to that feeling, and they also become addicted to the convenience of never having to think for themselves, of never having to move out of a place of boredom. You know, they aren't afforded that opportunity to use their imagination right. to create something, to create right. fun. And, and like you guys are saying, kids won't know what to do. They'll say everything's boring right. and they're right. disengaged. Yeah. So I think that on top of the cyberbullying mm -hmm. definitely is contributing. Yeah. I wish we could talk about that longer. Yeah. Could you guys, um, obviously sending students to your children to Waldorf is, is one thing you can do, but for parents, um, you know, what are other things that parents can do to uh, help foster imagination and, and to help their, their children thrive yeah, in this so digital world. There are so many ways, and I think these activities that I'm going to suggest not only you know, minimize that harmful exposure, mm -hmm. but also builds a one-on-one -on -one connection with your child. 
Um, and so ways that parents can do this on a weekly, daily basis is telling them stories, you know, from their day. Um, even if it's reading from a chapter book, they're creating their inner pictures, they're creating that sense of imagination. Um, giving them sort of open-ended toys and um, sort of artistic materials that they can kind of grapple with, whether mm -hmm. it be sculpting or whether it be drawing or painting, that gives them sort of this initiative and, and yeah. sense of empowerment. Um, let them be bored. Let them work through that yeah. boredom. That's an important know? one. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's absolutely necessary. And I think, um, I mean, just you can definitely see the effects of how children are so in tune with the vibrations in the world. So instead right. of giving that, giving that media dense vibration, let them be in nature, experience and sort of um, be in tune with their environment. We have the ocean here that they can, the endless possibilities of sand play um, and being out there with their families. I think it's just such a great opportunity. And I think when yeah. we talk about family too, you know, look at your greater family. You know, who is your community around you that yeah. you can create an agreement with, that you can create a beach day with, that you can decide how you use technology? How often are your teenagers going to be communicating with each other? What's reasonable? What images do we want our kids to see? Those are all great things that as a community and a family, yeah. that we can create a shared agreement and really help to build our kids up. And I really feel together. that if you give them less, they grow more. You oh, know? absolutely. And, you, and, and mm -hmm. I think, like we said, we want to create creators yes. for our society, not, not just consumers. consumers. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And for parents that are interested to learn more about Waldorf, mm -hmm. how can they do that? We feature some tours every Tuesday, Tuesday mornings, and that's an open tour. We love to invite anyone we can have. Sometimes we have some students that will host. We have a, a great veteran teacher that walks everyone around. And actually tonight we have an open house that is a journey through the grades. So Very they'll get cool. an opportunity to actually experience Waldorf education with no technology and see how, how well they can do at trigonometry and physics. <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you guys so much for, for being on and letting us uh, get a better understanding of how Waldorf creates imagination in children and how that links to higher conceptual thinking and Absolutely. independent thinking and critical thinking, which we all agree are such important skills as mm -hmm. well as the interpersonal skills, yeah. those abilities to look each other in the eye, to cooperate, as, as you pointed out, Yuka. Yeah. Um, I think that's really helpful for yeah understanding and the, the community value again to parents mm -hmm. that parents don't uh, feel the same pressure that they yeah. feel more free mm -hmm. because Absolutely. there's this open discussion and agreements going on in the school about uh, a healthy amount of tech and media exposure that's all um, amazing yeah and um, and I would just add connecting to what you guys said about the power of community in the school um, I wanted to uh, remind my audience that uh, this month I will be starting a, uh, a Facebook group for parents who want to elevate this issue at their school. If you're interested, please send me an email at screentimereset at gmail.com. Um, Waldorf is already doing it. Other schools can too. Again, even if you're further on the liberal side of tech, a few parents working together can really help elevate this issue and help make um, healthier, a healthier culture working with their school for all of the students. So uh, I'd love if you would email me if you're a parent who is interested in being a part of that. And I would like to thank you both so much for being here. And thank you, the audience, for spending the time out of your busy day to uh, listen to this very, uh, I believe, very important topic that, that's affecting kids all over the country and the world. Thank you so much, and until next time. Thanks, Lauren.